what we were thinking when we first set out the vision for this conference. So we, we wanted to do it a little bit differently, uh, knowing that the majority of the audience will be composed of medical students. So we're thinking of doing something that is a little less academic and you know, of pure informational nature, but rather inspiring, thought provoking. I think that is what we as students really need to know uh, when we want to make our final decision to enter a career in neurosurgery. So if you have the chance to look at the program booklet, you'll probably see a lot of recurring motives. I think the word future comes up quite a couple of times. So we will, for example, look at the future of spine surgery and the role technology will play. Um, we will have a boundless uh, new horizon session, which will close the conference tomorrow where we will have a particular look at what our master neurosurgeons are spending their time trying to push the boundaries of neurosurgical practice in their everyday life. Other things that we want to focus on are things where we really want to foster debate, uh, stimulate debate uh, between you all when it comes to things like gender equity, right, where we still have this huge gender gap in neurosurgery. For this, we have invited um, uh, a very well uh, accomplished female neurosurgeon from Pakistan, Dr. Anila Darbar, for example. Uh, unfortunately, she couldn't make it here, but she will participate virtually to speak about the things that she has accomplished and what gender equity in neurosurgery really means to her. And there are a lot of uh, things where we thought our students really need to be um, need to know how to look at neurosurgery from different perspectives. We will, in a bit, uh, hear about how to really deal with complications. For example, I mean, you know, we as medical students, we do have our perfectionist tendencies at times. Uh, I think that's that just comes from nature. Um, so we are all afraid of making mistakes. And Professor Mehmet Zilili, for example, will speak about how to deal with making mistakes and how to cope with this, how to improve every single day. Of course, uh, yeah, I like to always think in three-step or three-point plans. So I try to think of three main advice that I want to give you, or especially the medical students, of course. Number one would be, as I said, we want this to be rather a forum to think and to discuss rather than just an academic uh, scientific program. But obviously, when, when you look back at this conference in a year from now, you'll probably have forgotten a lot of things that were mentioned here. That's completely fine. But one major advice that I can give you is to really pinpoint a major, like a main aspect that each of our master neurosurgeons have shared with us today. Because these are the things that will always stick in mind, where even in years from now, you will think back and say, okay, yeah, Professor Meyer mentioned this and that uh, during his lecture in Crete. Number two would be, the most important thing about a conference is certainly making connections, networking. I mean, it's so beautiful to see a full hall. It's the first time that I, see uh, you know, a, a, a hall full like this since the beginning of the pandemic. So I think this is the best, um, this is the best opportunity for all of us to build friendships, to build connections that will be long lasting. Also, of course, I want you all to really make use of the fact that we have some of the most famous neurosurgeons around. So obviously in the coffee breaks or even after the scientific program, do feel encouraged to speak to our professors and really learn how they view, uh, how they look back to their careers. Maybe you have a few personal questions that you want to ask them. Feel free to do that. I'm very sure their professors would be glad to answer those questions. And number three is, um, I'm trying to think of number three spontaneously, but I think, 
the one thing uh, that we should really um, try to do is, you know, the conference does not end with the end of the scientific program tonight, right? So we will have a lot of different things that we want to do together after, uh, you know, this late afternoon, this evening, a soccer tournament, there's going to be the Dandy Olympiad, there's going to be a Sunday trip uh, where we want to explore Hania Town and Lake Kurnas, and I think this is definitely a good opportunity for all of us uh, to get together. Um, so I really appreciate uh, to be able to stand here. When I'm in charge of doing something, it always starts with a delay, but I hope uh, we'll just uh, cope with the time. Now, I would like to introduce Vice Mayor of Hania, uh, Dr. Uh, Mr. Nikolaos uh, Hazirakis on the stage. Ms. Hazirakis, please. Thank, thank you very much. Good morning to everyone. It is with a great pleasure that I am in this wonderful hotel today to welcome here in Hanya the beginning of the first Medical Student World Congress of Neurosurgery. Through such subnational events like this one that starts today, we have the opportunity to give you a glimpse of our hometown Hanya, a city of many tales that left its print through the centuries of geographical, historical, and cultural reasons. Our ambition for our city is to restore its place as a center of culture, arts, sciences, and sports. This ambition is implemented in addition to the other efforts and by hosting important events such as this conference. Understanding the activity of a healthy and an altered brain is a vital focus of scientific research. In this respect, making progress in the field of neurosurgery is one of the most important global challenges for our, of our time, with a lot of questions still remaining. Without, without any other delay, I would like to welcome you to Hanya and to wish to all of you to have an enjoyable stay. I will be glad to hear your findings and conclusions about your innovative and valuable research at this meeting. Thank you very much. Welcome, Hanya. Thanks a lot for your warm welcome, Ms. Azirakis. Next up, I would like to call Mariana to the stage. She is our annual meeting chair, and she has been in charge of organizing all the logistics of this conference. She had a lot of weight on her shoulders, but she did a great job. Mariana, please. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to welcome you to our Congress and to my beautiful homeland, Crete. It is a great pleasure and honor for me to be here among so many future doctors and great personalities who are leaders of the neurosurgical field. I would like to welcome you by narrating you some facts of Greek history, as well as introducing you to some historical Greek personalities who have pushed themselves to their limits and were undoubtedly boundless fingers. As you can see in the first picture, there is a skull where you can see one hole on it. This skull has been found in Crete. According to many archaeologists, this is the first neurosurgical procedure ever and is estimated around 3000 BC. The scientists that investigated this skull supported that this, this could not have been done by accident or by natural causes. So they concluded that this skull has been strategically perforated. 
Perhaps it is not a coincidence that we are here in Greece for our first student congress in neurosurgery, where neurosurgery may have been invented. There are many examples of boundless thinkers in the ancient and modern history of Greece, and you can find them in any field, history, politics, science, art, literature, and sports. You might have heard of Alexander the Great, who is in the second picture. This man, by the age of 30, had created one of the largest empires in history, stretching from Greece to northwestern India. The ancient Greeks did also establish the Olympic Games and the theater as we all know them today. One more leader from modern history is the politician from Hanya, Eleutherius Venizelos, who was an expert on foreign politics and international relations. From the field of medicine, I would like to introduce you to two great doctors, George Papanicolaou and Amelia Fleming. In the 1920s, George Papanicolaou invented the Papanicolaou test, abbreviated as PAP test and also known as PAP smear, which is a method of cervical screening used to detect potentially precancerous and cancerous processes in the cervix. This test has helped all women in the world to deter cervical cancer. Amelia Fleming, who was the wife of Alexander Fleming, managed to distinguish herself among many scientists, but also served as a member of parliament, became the president of the Association of Greek Women Scientists, and fought for human rights and justice between men and women. From the part of literature, I would like to mention three prominent people, Mikos Kazantzakis, Odysseus Litis, and George Seferis. All of them have been proposed for the Nobel Prize, but only Odysseus Litis and George Seferis were finally nominated. Of course, there are many examples of global leaders and boundless thinkers, but I just wanted to introduce you to some of them who are Greeks, and perhaps you didn't have the chance to hear them before. I wish you all a pleasant attendance. I'm sure that you will enjoy your time here and that you will want to come back to Greece again. I would also like to personally thank every single member of organizing committees for the collaboration that we have had all this time, and I hope to have the opportunity to work with them again in the future. Last but not least, I would like to especially thank Professor Salim Abdulrauf, who has placed his trust on me for this event. Thank you all for your time, for coming, and wish you enjoy this Congress. Thank you very much, Mariana, for this excursion into Greek history. We will see a lot more of that tomorrow morning. Now I would like to welcome Dilara on the stage. She is our scientific program chair. To open the first scientific session of the conference, the keynote session featuring Professor Mehmet Zilali from Izmir and Professor Bernard Meyer from Munich. Please, Delara. Thank you very much, Ibrahim. Yeah, please. Uh, we'd like to welcome Professor <laughs> Mehmet Zilali on stage. We wanted to start off our conference with world renowned speakers from around the world who are experts in their fields, Professor Mehmet Zinali and Professor Bernard Meyer. Uh, they're experts in spine surgery. Professor Mehmet Zinali came all the way from Izmir, uh, Turkey. Uh, he's a spine surgeon and the founder of the first fellowship program of spine surgery in Turkey that has fellows both nationally and internationally. He's also the president of the Middle East Spine Society and the president of the Asian Pacific Spine Society. Professor Zinelli, the stage is yours. Thanks a lot. Uh, uh, it's my great pleasure to be uh, with very young colleagues and the future of uh, uh, neurosurgery, I think it will come from you. Uh, can I? Take this in the middle part. Okay. 
Uh, my talk will, uh, my presentation order will be uh, in this order. Uh, I will. Thank you. Short CV, then the complication avoidance in spine surgery. Then I will mention the learning from mistakes and uh, we'll try to uh, make some outlines about the future of spine surgery and neurosurgery and art. A very unique subject, probably. Uh, how, I, how do I define myself? <laughs> it's interesting, it's, it has turned. Physician, neuroscientist, surgeon, or amateur artist. Maybe uh, it's it easy for this slide. Uh, I'm from Izmir. Izmir is the third big city of Turkey uh, with 3.5 million population. Um, a very uh, mild city, uh, easy to live, very modernized, uh, according to some others, uh, not hectic like Istanbul. Uh, I was the resident in uh, Ege University Neurosurgery Department in 1980 to 86. This is me. Uh, my first mentor was uh, Adam Tuchpai. Uh, she passed away. Uh, she, he was graduated from Chicago Western University and get a board certification from US and has founded uh, Ege University Neurosurgery Department in 1966. One of the pioneering uh, uh, neurosurgeons in in uh, Turkey. I had the uh, opportunity to go to Kopf Klinikum Erlangen. Uh, I know ba Bernard Mayer was also there. Uh, it was uh, with Professor Schramm and Farbush. Uh, I did uh, some research studies on spine cord injury and. Uh, Intra uh, operative monitoring, uh, electrophysiologic monitoring. These are some friends. This is Dr. Romstuck, Dr. Taniguchi, and Professor Schramm, uh, who has retired. Uh, uh, and then my third mentor probably is Edward Benzel. Uh, I met him in 1999, and I, I've been with him for, for some periods. Uh, and uh, when I was back from that, uh, I started uh, to find to found a spine section of Turkish Neurosurgery Society uh, in 1995, and uh, we organized courses and uh, we uh, tried to implement uh, modern uh, spine surgery in neurosurgery. Actually, uh, before that time. Uh, neurosurgery was lacking with uh, instrumentation and stabilization of the spine. Uh, these are advanced spine courses. We did uh, two uh, cadaver spine courses with, together with Ed Benzel. Uh, and we pursued them uh, with the uh, advanced spine courses. This year, we will make it the 20th course. And we are as of uh, progressing with the Istanbul Spine Masters. This uh, ne next year will be sixth course. I, as uh, my uh, uh, moderator mentioned, I, I'm, nowadays I'm serving as chairman of the WFS Spine Committee. And uh, what about complication avoidance in spine surgery? Uh, there are many topics to present in this, but I will just give some examples from the, those. The most common complication is probably the dural tear and CSF leakage and pedicle screw malpositioning. Uh, I will, not most common probably, but uh, I will just give some examples from those. Uh, dural tears incidence is, uh, uh, has been reported between one to 15%. Uh, we, we believe that they are underreported in the literature because the, the surgeon uh, does not write that he, he or she has uh, lacerated the dura during surgery to the report, and then we cannot know that. 
uh, that there are instances where it most commonly happens. And the, uh, in the disc surgery, uh, in the experienced hands, it is quite uncommon. Uh, not experienced hand is more common. Uh, and uh, in the uh, minimally invasive surgery, it's in the startup period, in the learning period, it's more common. Clinical findings may be CSF leakage, headache, meningocell, and nerve root injury. If duality is causes CSF leakage, then complications may happen. One of the most important complications is infection. Uh, more uncommon complication is pseudomeningocell and intracranial hypotension, acute sutural hematoma, and tonsil herniation. It's very uncommon, but it may happen. This is one example of pseudomeningocell uh, after a drug here of hemilaminectomy at L5, F, L5 level. If it doesn't cause any, any symptom, we can just leave it, just observe it. How to avoid and repair them? Uh, it's uh, a common sense that uh, we have to try to repair it uh, if we see that. Uh, and uh, primary repair, uh, if, if, if it is not very uh, possible, we, we can cover it with grafts, fat, muscle, uh, fascia, blood patch, and gel foam. There are uh, recently many tissue sealants and fibrin glue and synthetic membranes uh, to repair the dural tears. Uh, dural repair during tumor retractor, it's a very uh, often used uh, minimally invasive spine uh, surgery tool. Uh, we, we use uh, uh, tubes uh, and make small incisions uh, and uh, it, it may be difficult to repair the dura, to, to make stitches on the dura. So needle driver and uh, laparoscopic nut pusher uh, may be used to uh, facilitate our stitches. Fat crafts uh, may also have advantages. Uh, however, if you, you push it too much, root compression and fibrosis inside the graft may happen. Uh, in, the, in the beginning, we uh, ask the patients bed rest, wound closure with prolonged stitches, external lumbar drainage we can apply, rate removal of wound drains, and revision surgery may, may, uh, we, we can do. And this is a, a series from uh, our department uh, with 9% uh, CSF leakages. Uh, but most of them are uh, complex spine surgery. Uh, these are the site of approach, type of approach, instrumentation. Uh, with instrumentation, it is more common. Without instrumentation, it's less common. And uh, these are the location and, uh, of surgery and CSF leakage. And we have done, uh, in total, 11 lumbar drainage late removal of wound trains 26 and revision surgery in five patients only. Yes, I can skip those. And uh, as I said before, uh, retrospective articles underestimate complication incidence, but it's been reported between 1 to 15 percent. What, what about the pedicle screw complication? Actually, to avoid pedicle screw malpositioning, uh, there are many, many techniques. One, one is that uh, you, you must use very often the AP and lateral uh, fluoroscopy. The other one is the navigation, uh, uh, CT-guided navigation or fluoroscopy navigation. Uh, uh, another one is the EMG monitoring uh, during uh, pedicle uh, screw insertion. Uh, but uh, screw mouth positioning has been reported between 1.2 to 28 uh, percent. How to avoid? More training on anatomy is necessary. Meticulous technique, uh, sufficient exposition, bony landmarks must be identified, identification of intact pedicle with key wire probe and EMG, 
AP and lateral view by CM and navigation uh, intraoperative CT scans. Uh, there are also intraoperative CT scan possibilities. How to treat early revision uh, may require, uh, especially such a screw position. The, the screw is, is passing through uh, uh, the middle of the uh, channel, uh, so then according to the level, it may it, it injures the uh, spinal cord or cauda equina. Uh, if it is on the lateral part, uh, it, uh, it doesn't, uh, it may not cause any nerve problem, but uh, it then uh, causes uh, a weak uh, uh, stabilization. So, because the, this, the screw is not inside the bone and it is a weak construct. So, if it enters outside the uh, vertebral body, and enter to the vertebral body, long screw, then it may injure the uh, great vessels like aorta or vena cava. Uh, again, more training and experience uh, are necessary to erase some such complications. However, we must uh, tell that experienced surgeon is the surgeon who has done many mistakes and who have learned from their mistakes. So it is sometimes a frustrating event uh, during the surgery or after surgery. You notice that uh, you have done some uh, uh, complication or, or a mistake. So uh, this is uh, our baseline. Uh, knowledge goes with raw data, basic science application, and clinical applications, and it continues to learn. So then experience adds it, it uh, and uh, your understanding the uh, techniques, surgical techniques, and uh, patient uh, selection uh, criteria uh, develops by the time uh, with your experience. How can we learn from mistakes? Probably, first we, can, we, we must mention the complication and mistake are something different. However, this difference is not very certain. Uh, th there are uh, instances that we cannot uh, differentiate a complication from a mistake. So, uh, sometimes patient may sue you uh, and then uh, that, that that problem cannot be uh, uh, differentiated from the other. Uh, I uh, like to uh, classify the uh, mistakes in spine surgery as mistakes of indication, approach, stabilization, and complication management. I will give you some examples and uh, the reasons of uh, those uh, complications or mistakes. This is a, uh, after trauma, I fall from hate in 2002, uh, who had a long fixation because of fracture dislocation. But, but after a while, uh, both ro rods have been broken. Uh, no, but if you see that there is no screw at T10 and T11, uh, and uh, the, the anterior strut is, is weak. So the, we made a reoperation, a revision surgery, uh, made a longer fixation and uh, placed an anterior graft. Uh, as you know, uh, our pedicle screws are uh, po posterior uh, uh, fixation devices and if there is not good anterior uh, strut, uh, they can fail. This is uh, from biomechanical concepts of momentum is force plus distance. So if we have, uh, this is the reasons of screw loosening and uh, the reasons of screw breakage. Uh, however, if we support anterior column, uh, such a breakage may not happen. 
So biomechanical concepts we must learn to apply some uh, spinal surgery uh, in our practice. Mistakes of complication management. This, this case had a, a previous anterior uh, plating and screw fixation, uh, but after a while, uh, the surgeon has seen this film. Uh, one of the screw has, two screws has get backed out, but one of them is about 50% backed out. So uh, he uh, proposed to follow the patient. Professor Zilli, I'm very sorry to interrupt. We have five minutes left. Five minutes, yeah. okay. Uh, but uh, after a while, the patient came with this film. One of the screws is lacking. So the screw has, has been lost. Probably has penetrated esophagus and went down to digestive system. So we, we removed all the system and we saw the esophagus was uh, ruptured and we uh, uh, repaired the esophagus. So, what are the reasons of mistakes? Lack of knowledge, insufficient training, uh, surgery without sufficient technical conditions, accepting new techniques or implants without consideration of evidence. And we must uh, improve our training with postgraduate courses, fellowship programs, be cautious to com company supported courses. Collaboration with general surgery and thoracic surgery and the approach may be easier uh, and more effective than posterior approach to some uh, extent. Uh, and in general saying, patient evaluation is more important than learning surgical techniques. And in conclusion, uh, to make less mistakes, uh, we must discuss more and choose proper indications Instruments are a tool, not an aim. Achieving a good vision is the aim of surgery. Uh, I will give some, uh, do I have some time uh, for uh, spine, surgical disciplines? Yes. The, uh, as you know, there is a big competition between neurosurgery and orthopedic surgery on spine, uh, but there are some medical disciplines like physical therapy, rheumatology, and uh, pain therapy. Uh, and uh, most of the spinal disorders patients come to you with non-specific symptoms, low back pain or neck pain. 85 to 90 percent of patients are those. And specific spinal disorders probably 10 to 15 percent of all population you see. Uh, so origins of the low back pain are various. And uh, in one patient you, you can have more than one origins of the pain. Uh, so the, the main issue is that operate the patient, not the films, uh, must be our uh, logo. Uh, and uh, technical improvements are allowed. Uh, uh, we will see in, in other lectures today. Uh, but with the normal, uh, I will show you one example. Uh, the instrumentation is, is very useful in some instances like this. Uh, actually, uh, normal aging is a kyphotic uh, development. We can turn it back probably, uh, but it's not that much easy. Uh, so, for instance, this case, this lady had a cervical thoracic uh, kyphosis. We had a two-stage surgery, uh, first on thoracic and then cervical spine. Uh, with multiple osteotomies and uh, we could achieve a position like this. It is possible. So, geriatric spine surgery possible but with good se selection and good planning. The compression fusion uh, and mobility preservation is probably f the future. Open surgeries are turning out to do minimally invasive surgeries. However, uh, patient examinations are lacking in our general practice and imaging evaluation uh, is uh, uh, resulting with incidental pathologies, operation of the films. Less implants, more implants, and economic burden uh, to, to the societies. And uh, we, I will, 
I will show you the, these two slides. More minimally invasive surgery in the future, more biotechnology and science, fusion enhancers and others, better outcome analysis in the future. Uh, these are future expectations, positive ex expectations. However, there are negatives. Insufficient patient evaluation, surgery for incidental image findings, unnecessary implants, effect of industry, increased cost, insufficient outcome analysis, and longer training period, and more unqualified surgeons. I can finish here. I can leave the others. Okay. Thank, Thank you very much, Professor Zinelli, for your beautiful presentation. We're honored to have heard, had the chance to hear, hear your advices and uh, have a look at your patients. Uh, we'll have questions with Professor Zinelli after we have Professor Meyer. Um, Professor Meyer has come all the way, uh, Bernard Meyer has come all the way from Munich, Germany. He's also a spine surgeon. Um, he's the chair of uh, neurosurgery, the neurosurgery department, and the director of the neurosurgical clinic at the Technical University uh, in Munich. And uh, he was uh, also the chairperson of the Education and Fellowship Committee of Eurospine. Um, when you're ready, Professor, the stage is yours. Can you make use of... Oh, it's hard to add. This is the presentation, by the way. Yeah. Perfect. Well, thank you very much for having me here. It's, uh, it's a new concept, but I'm happy to be here and give a talk. I hope um, it's a talk that you understand. Usually I talk in front of doctors, so it's new to talk in front of uh, students. I should tell you something about uh, the role of technology in spine surgery. And I will start out by uh, showing you a problematic issue. This is Scott Sparello. Scott, uh, Mr. Scott was a doctor from uh, the UK, and um, what it shows you in a more or less funny way is that many technologies, especially in spine surgery, fail. Actually, more, more technologies that are brought in will fail than will survive. And it's always the same, there's initial hype, and then it goes down, and uh, after several years, nobody knows what has been uh, the case and why it has been used. So I start my talk by giving you some guidance on how to use technology, according to me, not to repeat the same mistakes that we have made 25 or 20 years ago. And then I will show you in the second stage of how to use it in a concept, in a clinical framework, a concept, so it makes sense. And in the end, I will pick out one specific technology and I show you the state of the art today, and I will show you pretty much what you will see in the next 20 years when you will become neurosurgeons and are inclined to do so. So <clears throat> it's always a problem of people to adopt a new technology. You have people on one end of the spectrum who are very eager and are so-called early adopters, but then on the other hand you have people who will never adopt a new technology because they're skeptic. So in, this, in life, it tends to be uh, truth lies in the middle. It depends also where you work. If you work in an academic center with a high volume, with highly complex cases, or if you work in a uh, center which is a community hospital or private hospital, low volume and, uh, and low complexity, you have to have a technology that makes it simple and not difficult, and you have to do it often, not in a special case. This is Occam's razor. I don't know if you know who Occam was. He was a philosopher and told you the principle is keep it simple. It's more complicated uh, philosophy, but the principle is keep it simple, otherwise it will fail. So if you look at it from people who never adopt to people who will ad uh, be rapid adopters, um, then you will have to have a technology that has a very low complexity for the one who uses it. 
It should also have a low cost, otherwise there will be uh, doubts on how much money would I invest, and it should be done in high volumes. So if you put that together, my advice would be, you have a technology that should clearly serve a clinical purpose or a need. Not technology comes first and you think, what am I going to do with it? And it's the best if you have it in a clinical framework, and I'll show you an example right after this. It should always make your work more efficient and improve the outcome. Be it incremental, be it a very small step, but it should improve. Or it should not, and that has been one of the mistakes in the past, distract you from the actual task of work. Working in the brain or spine is complex enough. If someone gives you a technology that makes it even more difficult because your attention is distracted from it, then it's not good. Don't even think about using it. It should never be used as a gadget, which was the number one mistake for many of these things that have failed, be it artificial disk, be it whatever. It has been a hype. It has been used to attract patients, lure patients into your practice, and that will always fail. And you should always think, how much money do I invest for something which has a small benefit? Okay? So I start uh, with, according to me, is a classical example. You have a clinical need in a clinical concept, and then you use the technology for the benefit of the patient. Spinal oncology is that. On your left-hand side, you see a curve, you don't have to look at it. It's just an example of what is happening in oncology in general. This is for non-small uh, cell lung cancer. This has been a death sentence a couple of years ago. For many, many patients nowadays, this has become a chronic disease. Some forms of cancers in my country have been declared a curable disease by major health insurances. So, you have to change your mindset. In another field, in oncology, something has happened which has made things completely different. Cancer is not a death sentence. Cancer has become, in the majority of patients, a chronic disease, just like chronic renal failure, etc., etc. So you have to adapt your concept to that. As a spine surgeon, you will see heaps of patients with metastasis in their spine. This is from our recent publication. It summarizes over 1,000 surgeries and our concept that we have adapted. The number one problem, if you look at the small picture in there, is that the standard of how patients were treated by open surgery, with instrumentation, with traditional titanium or chrome cobalt things, has a problem in cancer patients. Up to 30% will develop a wound problem later on in the course because of their adjuvant therapy or their radiotherapy. Now, a wound problem is not a minor problem for a cancer patient because if a cancer patient develops a wound problem, then you interrupt that thing that keeps him alive, which is his targeted therapy, his chemotherapy, or his local control therapy with radiotherapy. So having a wound problem or not makes a difference if you live or you don't live for a cancer patient, okay? So, in this instance, this is where minimally invasive spine surgery has the most value because it reduces your wound problems. To do so, you need navigation so you have always your construct in place and don't need revision surgeries. Plus, we also adapted something which is new, cement augmented screws, because with minimally invasive, you don't have a fusion, but you need a stable contract for over many years and the latest thing we adopted was radiolucent implant things. I just go through that very quickly. If you use navigation, you reduce, instead of using fluoroscopy or x-rays during surgery, you reduce the, the radiation exposure of yourself and the patient by the factor of 10. You reduce the rate of patients you have to revise after surgery by half. This is also true for cervical spine, and not only for lumbar spine. The only thing that you have invested is time and energy initially. 
It means it takes you about nine months in a major center like mine where many people are drained and you have a lot of people running around, technicians and OR nurses, until you come back to your normal times. That means you have to use that technology every day several times. Otherwise, it will fail. For example, the other thing, new technology, radiolucent materials, it gives you better perioperative complication rate, you have a better oncological follow-up, you have better radiation planning and execution. This is an MR with instrumentation in place. As it is, you had nothing in there. If you compare that to an MR post-operatively with a, a titanium screw where you don't see anything, that makes a big difference. And this makes also a difference if you go a step further, radiation planning, if you don't see anything, will always be that you have tiny doses over several times, and you include uh, more volume in that. If you see afterwards, if you use a radiolucent material, you can have higher doses for a better local control because your volume is less. So we would treat uh, per default, the patient with a metastasis like that um, in a navigated anterior posterior surgery, one stop shop, patient lies 45 degrees, you put in pedicle screws uh, from the back through stab incisions with navigation and without the patient turning around, you do a minimally invasive thoracotomy like that and do a, a vertebral body replacement. It takes about two hours uh, and it's all done. That's the result. So I hope I could give you an idea of when it makes sense to use new technologies in a concept like spine tumor surgery concept. It reduces your wound problems by, <coughs> by five, it reduces your revision rates by half using navigation and cement augmentation. It allows for a very early uh, adjuvant therapy, be it radiotherapy or other. It allows for innovative radiation concept to enhance that local control and it keeps your patient up and running. That means independent through all stages. So this is a context where technology and adopting it makes sense. Now I pick out one, which I've been talking about, image guidance and robotics in spine search and show you the evolution. We well, all started many years ago when you had 3D imaging available in the OR and it developed over these years and um, in my department, today, we have 3D fluoroscopy navigation. Three times we have a proper CT navigation. We have intraoperative robotics, which is the CERC. I will show you that. So this is my presence. It might be the future for others, but this is the presence and the state of art that I have. We're adding to that now augmented reality, which has been fumbled around a little bit. And this is the newest development uh, that I did. Which is a, a camera and a decoder. And then you can use any tablet. You don't need big things, big screens or whatever. Because everything you have is in the glasses. I think I can show you that. This is... These were the first searches that we did. So you see me looking not on the screen of that tablet behind me, but I see exactly what is there in my classes and I can look at what I'm doing. have to look at any screen uh, but you see on the right hand side is what I see in my glasses overlapping what I do obviously that makes a difference but then everything is very mean so um, it's quite clear nowadays that spinal navigation improves your search increases your accuracy you reduce your revision rate reduces the radiation exposure especially if you don't see the anatomy, if you use MIS. But it leaves room for improvement. You, you see figures here, they are very good, but uh, the German saying goes that the better is the enemy of the good. 
So you're always tr trying to be better than that. And that the question is, or was, can robots help you with that? In principle, they could, because they have no fatigue, they never tremble, and they can repeat infinitely the same thing without getting tired with the same precision. You cannot do that. So, to bridge that gap is the problem that you have nowadays. So, the number one, you can't read what that, the, I, I have been writing there, the number one reason for making mistakes or having a screw not placed properly with navigation is never the machine. It's always the surgeon. And I can show you on that picture why. I'm holding a drill guide, looking at the screen. And then I need the drill. If with my left hand I'm grabbing the drill, the line of sight is broken. And I will shift that drill guide only a bit, but enough to have the wrong trajectory. If I look back, I still have the same trajectory on the screen, and I will use the obviously wrong trajectory for that. This is because I'm not a robot. I can't do several things together, like moving my left arm without being completely stable with my right arm, etc. So this is where a robot nowadays helps, no less, um, no more. There are four robots on the market that you can uh, buy for spinal surgery. This up on the left-hand corner is the development with which it all started. I show you. It's a Maso technology, which is now bought by Medtronic, a major competitor on the market, and has, has several developments. Now it's a huge machine, as you can see. It's the same huge machine as the Excelsius from Globus, and then the other one here, the Rosa, and the smaller one from BrainLab. The, uh, the, the three that they see, they're up to a million dollars each, okay? Depending on where you live. I started using robots in 2007. This is the first robot. It's an actuator, looks like a Coke can. Uh, you give him the navigational position, you bring him near the field, and then he will guide the arm of your drill guide exactly in the position. You just have to use the drill and go in and out, and then you have the correct thing. It wasn't quite as easy because there were many things that were not really good. So we had two publications very early out and we didn't adopt the technology at that time because we said it has too many flaws. Actually, this thing is not different from the tiny thing you just saw. It just looks that way. And this is sold to you as a revolution in spine surgery. It's not. It's light years away from being a revolution. This is a very, very expensive holder of your drill guide. No less, no more. Nothing else happens. Professor Moy, I'm very sorry to interrupt. You have five yeah. minutes left. How many minutes? Five minutes. Five minutes. That's good. I'm... I show you this with the cert, that that's the arm that we have. Because of that picture, I can't see where I am. The, his arm is there. You bring it in position, and it simply holds where you are. You can have an actuator in front of it that gives you a tiny guidance, but that's it. No less, no more, okay? And the others are just bigger, but do the same. So the question is, is that really a revolution? No, it's, it's certainly not. And you know why? Because this is the future. Look at it. That's an industrial robot. This is a balloon, it has a needle on it, okay? And this is what he can do. See? This is actually available, this thing. Now, same here, I don't know if you can see it right. This thing exerts the same pressure exactly millions of times. This is a thing that you can do because he can feel and he has haptics. 
No robots today in medicine have haptics, okay? So this is an industrial robot. In industries, this is already state of the art. Okay? Fully automatic in a workflow. You see the same arm that I showed you. It's um, something that will be present when you will be probably spine surgeons in 10 years. It should be simple. This is a very simple concept how to do that. So you don't need any expert knowledge. It should be intuitive, okay? So, you need tactile robots, and they need to be soft. Soft means they adapt to what you do. And the next step that is already present and that we are doing is that they learn. And I hope this is the last video that I can show. I have the privilege to work with a very good group of uh, people. So, this is learning to self. On the left hand side you see a child of the age of four learning to hold a weight or learning to open a door with a key. And on the left hand side you see the same robot arm learning that. Or this is something they did with, uh, I think, people from their home base. They did several tasks and every time the robot beats the human being. So this is the future and this is what the future would look like um, when you uh, will be probably 20 years down the line. But in the next five years the first thing that you will see is probably a robot in spine surgery that acts a little bit like you had seen in the first video that has a haptic feedback but you still need to control it yourself. And then step by step we will take another seven years or so because of the major safety issues, it will have semi-automatic features. And the thing that you just saw doing it completely by itself, like uh, constructing an automobile, will probably be 25 years to 30 years down the line. Good. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Maya, for a wonderful presentation and taking us into the future of spine surgery. We'll just have one question from Professor uh, Abdurraouf, and then we go into coffee break. Thank you so much for our I go and spend, do a residency of four or five years, become a really exceptional spine surgeon. Why do I need to learn all these things for years that I will never do the rest of my career? Some years ago, as you guys know, I wrote an editorial where I suggested that neurosurgery in the future needs to be self-specialized training rather than training everybody to do everything. And many of my mentors in the generation before were very critical of me writing that editorial. So the question is this, should we have a separate residency for spine surgery and a separate residency for cranial surgery? The data shows that high volume means better outcome for patients. If you certainly do certain things all the time, you'll have better outcomes for patients. So is it antiquated model, the current training models we have? You go, you spend six, seven years training in everything.
<coughs> yeah, good question. Um, uh, the same is true for orthopedic surgeons, actually. They learn how to make the shoulder surgery, knee surgery, hip surgery, uh, uh, trauma, uh, many aspects, and then spine. Uh, the issue with us uh, was, since now, uh, the m most privileged part of orthopedic uh, 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 discipline is spine surgery, was spine surgery, but for neurosurgery, it is not. It is most le less privileged part. Uh, uh, the people who wanted to be a good vascular surgeon or uh, skull-based surgeon, such things. Uh, but the future will, uh, is demanding from us uh, that we have to create a specialty of spine surgery or spine specialty. As I mentioned in one, one of my slides, uh, <coughs> there are orthopedics, uh, neurosurgeons, rheumatologists and physical therapists and pain physicians all are doing many things in spine and we don't know each other very well and we are very busy in our residency programs with uh, cranial surgery and also spine surgery the the, the issue the, uh, is that uh, the there is a market and then general neurosurgeons surgeons don't leave that market don't want to leave, economic reasons, because uh, although they learn a lot about the cranial surgery, in the practice they do mostly spine. Even my vascular surgeons, if they do private, they do spine. And so uh, this will be more uh, improved by ne next generation. Thank you. So what you said about the oh, same thing, if you're a four, five leader, to medical student, you go into orthopedics to become a spine surgeon, you spend years doing shoulder and limb surgery, why? Uh, so, Professor Ma. Right, it's happening anyway. So, um, this is something that will be real when you, when you 20 years down the line, there will be a spine surgeon. That's quite clear. But you have to go with a smooth transition because otherwise society, I mean, be it, our societies, neurosurgical societies, the society of patients, uh, there's too much stress on them. You have to give them time. Uh, and, but exactly what I'm doing, I mean, the last 10 years I've spent uh, to put up programs for Germany, for Europe, um, and how to be a spine surgeon. So this is all fixed and set. And uh, the transition to having a subspecialization is basically just a year away, if at all, at least in, in, in my country and in Europe. So you will have a basic training in neurosurgery, not doing everything, and then you specialize early. The only thing that you have to do then is then you say, well, let's say we're only doing three years of basic neurosurgical training or basic orthopedic training, and then you become a spine surgeon. And the content of that should be interdisciplinary, it, be it orthopedic, be it uh, 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 neurosurgical. There shouldn't be any division between that. And then probably another 10 years down the line, when everything has adapted to the subspecialization, then it's quite obvious. Then there is the specialist, and then everything else will follow. So I, I think um, you... So you're telling me this generation will adapt to that, the people graduate next year. Oh, well, they, they will have to benefit that they, depending on where you are, I think it's the same in the US than in, within Europe. I can't uh, speak for Asia. Um, you will have a, a very special program that gives you all the content, be it that you are a young orthopedic or a young neurosurgical resident. If your focus is on spine, the person who trains you needs to follow that, otherwise he doesn't get any accreditation. So it's quite easy, you get the content, so the political things around that will follow. Uh, we have one second. I just want to. We have the next generation of also leaders of spine surgery. Dr. Al Rancon from Mexico is here. I want to get his. He's one generation after you. I want to get his input on this question really quickly, Dilara. One sure. Minute. And, yeah. Just one. I just really want our students to speak to you. So please, Dilara. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
Well, that's uh, a very good question. I mean, nowadays, if I, if I turn uh, a little back in my practice, I, I mean, I love neurosurgery, and, and that's uh, since, what, since what I was a kid, I wanted to be a neurosurgeon. However, uh, my practice currently is 99% is uh, spine surgery. So probably if, if I had the, the chance or like um, if I had this, uh, this view, particularly like a, a specific spine um, surgery uh, specialty, uh, more defined, probably would be like uh, the best way to go if you get just into it uh, for the, the, uh, the next uh, six, seven years probably. Uh, probably the same years as a neurosurgery and with the silver specialty, uh, probably uh, like the, the formal spine surgery program, but then like a silver specialty like pediatric spine surgery, like uh, something more like, like that. So probably would, would be a good idea, but uh, I don't know. I mean, it's... Uh, as Dr. Mayer said, it's a lot of uh, um, things, uh, political things also, so administrative, but hopefully in the future. <laughs> Thank you all. Yeah. Thank you all. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. <laughs> we'll be having a 10 minute coffee break and then we'll have you back here again. Thank you very much. Jason, can you hear? Yeah, sure. Let me uh, set, check something real quick. Okay, so we have this basically. Uh, so, yeah. Okay, just waiting for the wireless um, uh, yeah, uh, mouse to uh, go ahead and add work.
sneakers in the middle of the block. We start, uh, we'll just uh, go on, uh, we'll just check in the microphone. Oh, uh, maybe. Uh,
go to my company and you select the good paper, then more or less you have to select the paper. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you know how to get the salt. We're, we're starting in 30 seconds, I would say. It's not, yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. I welcome you all back. One of the words that I'm probably going to use most frequently over the course of the next two days is the word boundless. Under the theme of the conference, boundless thinking, we decided to dedicate two lectures to this motto specifically. So we will have the boundless ingenuity lecture today and the boundless diversity lecture tomorrow. Boundless ingenuity is really dedicated to surgical innovation and outside the box thinking. And we've invited one of the best speakers to talk about this topic. Unfortunately, he could not make it to Crete. He will give us his talk virtually. And Jonut, our representative from the scientific program committee, please welcome on the stage to introduce Dr. Ike Cherry. Okay. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. It is my honor to introduce to you Professor Ike Cherian, a school-based expert, a passionate educator, and the founding chairman of the Neurosurgical Department at Krishna Institute of Medical Sciences in Karat, India. He is the Counselor General of the Asian Congress of Neurological Surgeons and a member of WFNS Anatomy Committee. Professor Chirian is the inventor of the basal cystenostomy, a school-based procedure to reduce intracranial pressure in traumatic brain injury. He then went on to introduce a theory on CSF circulation and its cooling and cleaning effects on the brain, on the, on the brain parenchyma. Thank you. Now I would like, I would like to introduce Professor Chirian. Professor, you may proceed. Yes, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay. All right. It's an honor to be talking to all of you. As they say, the child is the father of uh, man. So you guys are the future. And uh, more than speaking in uh, audiences where you have aged and not so flexible minds. It's always good to talk to people whose minds are at least uh, open to some extent. You know, medical education, uh, I believe, destroys a lot of flexibility, but uh, at least before they are professors of neurosurgery, you're still uh, flexible. Now, Thank you, Salim. Thank you, Ibrahim and the organizers for calling me to this. I, I know Ibrahim for a long time. I am trying to share my screen. Uh, okay. Can you see my screen? Yes. Right. Great. 
So you're going to talk about uh, new perspectives uh, in uh, CSF. Now, I was very happy to hear Bernard talking on uh, Frank Ayanika. We just acquired a Frank Ayanika, uh, which we have managed to navigate and it's uh, being used as our endoscope holder. Um, as he said, of course, I, although I don't do any spine surgery, I agree that robotics uh, are the future not probably as a surgeon substitute, but uh, something to help the surgeon at the moment. Uh, to be a surgeon substitute, I guess it will take 100 years more at whatever pace we go, because as me and probably Salim would agree, a surgeon um, is a different beast. So uh, there's a lot of things that a robot has to be able to do to be equating to a surgeon. That aside, we're talking about something different today. Uh, you know, 2007, we started something quite accidentally. And that was the micro neurosurgery and opening systems, opening the basal systems for trauma happened quite accidentally. Um, in fact, to tell a long story short, I would say that I mistook a head trauma for an aneurysm. So in aneurysm, you generally, when you have a tight brain, you go to the system, you open the system, because the aneurysm is in the system. So you have to open the system. There's no way you can get out um, clipping an aneurysm without opening the system. So when you open the systems, Generally, the brain becomes lax. I mistook, uh, I won't tell you how I mistook, it's a long story, uh, but all over the world, wherever there's trauma, in fact, five, six of the world has a lot of trauma. And this is a theme I got uh, from one of my fellows. This is a photograph that they were operating and you can see the brain, the subdural is being evacuated and in a few minutes, that's what happened. You can see on the right side, the brain's bulging out. And this is called malignant brain edema. And this is one of the most feared things in neurosurgery. You know, it's, uh, we call it some scarabs that the fears from generations, like fear of snakes, um, and many, many, many communities have different samskaras. So neurosurgical, neurosurgical communities, fear is this malignant, so-called malignant brain swelling. People say nothing, there's nothing they can do about it. So we looked at the scans of these patients. After accidentally we figured that, uh, you know, the brain is swelling out. So we looked at the scans and we found that there's no CSF. The brain was edematous. There was no CSF. So we asked a few guys, a few neurosurgeons, where did all the CSF go? You know, physics is not the strong point for most neurosurgeons. So they said the CSF got compressed. That's not possible because if you knew hydraulics, you will know that to compress 100 ml of uh, fluid to almost nothing, you would require the weight of a car maybe more even, okay? So it was not possible. So we figured that the CSF was moving somewhere. Where was it moving? Probably to inside the brain, inside the brain. And is that possible? Because the CSF is in the base of the brain. We think the CSF exists because the brain should be suspended on that CSF. And if you, uh, take out the CSF, the brain might deform. If this is what our thinking of CSF is about. The conventional thinking of CSF is that the brain is bathed in that. It's like a whale in a sea. So if you beach a whale, the whale is going to die. You see, if God or any power who created or uh, even evolution was the designer for such a brain, 
I would call him foolish unless he figured some other uses for it. So we started thinking that maybe the CSF is going inside normally as well. And we started working on it and we figured that all the blood vessels from the system went into the brain. You can see the blood vessels, all the blood vessels are in the system. That's why aneurysms are in the systems and all these blood vessels go into the brain and they arise in the systems. We also figured that the CSF, the CSF goes around these vessels. They go around these vessels into the brain and the space that they go around these vessels they're called Wurscher Robin spaces. They've been known from a long time. So in other words, you have a system in the base and then you have subarachnoid hemorrhage into that system. The pressure in the system rises and this CSF is displaced in the brain. And imagine injecting 100 ml to your 1.5 liter Coca-Cola bottle. Imagine injecting, let's say, 100 ml into the Coca-Cola bottle. You know, the pressure will be immense. It will be immense. Exactly what is happening. So there's bleeding into the cisterns. I'll, I'll, I'll talk about it in the furthest and latest slides. Now, first thing, whether our theory is right. 2007, we had no evidence. We were just staying there. And, uh, you know, I, I, at that time, I was located in Nepal and uh, imagine a neurosurgeon from Nepal saying that and uh, the world community, they laughed. 2012, we had evidence from Harvard. So this is uh, a photograph, a 3D photograph of a vessel and you can see the cistern continuing all the way around these vessels. Beautiful. This is exactly what we told people in 2007. And to Salim's credit, I must say, before the evidence came, Salim used to call me for his lectures. Skull base and vascular faculty, but uh, we used to talk about systems at least 11, 12 years back with Salim. And uh, that's, uh, that's why he's a visionary. So, um, I mean, well, it could have been a foolish theory uh, nobody was accepting us at that time, but this evidence came later on. And you can see, this is the vessel, my arrow, you can see, that's the vessel, and around that you can see the version of the spaces. And exactly what's happening, so this is the vessel, and you can see the virtual of spaces, and these virtual of spaces are communicating with every part of the brain. So imagine there's a bleeding in here. What happens? That bleeding is a newcomer into the system. It presses the CSF. Now the blood, by virtue of the size of RBG, cannot enter into these virtual organ spaces. Therefore, what happens? What shifts into the virtual organ spaces is the fluid, is the CSF. So if our theory was right, this whole subarachnoid space will be filled with blood and the brain parenchyma or this virtual organ spaces will be filled with fluid. So that was, that was our hypothesis. And so if that happened, the current treatment for trauma, severe head trauma, is decompressive hemicrinectomy. So you have a edematous brain and you open out a large bit, a large bit of the bone, you allow the brain to swell. It's, uh, it's a hundred year old surgery. It has got a lot of winning factors. It's a big surgery. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a simple, very simple surgery. Um, a trained chimpanzee could do it. I mean, I'm not exaggerating. Um, I see all these trauma surgeons harping around decompressive hemicranic to me. It's, uh, um, you know, they go to all these uh, conferences and talk about the technique of uh, decompressing hemicrinectomy. I would say milking, milking a cow on my farm would require more technique. 
if I must say so. And I apologize for it, but that's the truth. So uh, the point is, if you could get into the basal system, if you could get into the basal system in a tight brain and open the systems and let out the CSF, this, this brain swelling is going to reverse. And that's exactly what we were doing. That's what people are already doing in aneurysm surgeries, and we started doing that for trauma. So then we talked about CSF tip. The articles, obviously, if it's a new concept, big neurosurgical journals are not going to publish it. So we started publishing in small journals. And then from Calgary, we got evidence. So Sorry, Professor, you have three minutes left. Ah, okay. So um, I'm sorry. Uh, I, uh, this is the evidence that we got. And I would say that they put weight onto uh, a weighted uh, a block onto a mice brain. And this is what happened. And exactly what we predicted this the subarachnoid spaces were uh, lined with blood and there was edema. So CSF, CSF shift edema was, we could uh, prove that CSF edema was, CSF shift edema was happening. Then, actually does so along very specifically. Then we started wondering, what is the CSF doing inside the brain? So in three minutes, I'm going to tell you what CSF does inside the brain. Now we are part of textbook, uh, many chapters, respected journals and all that. But uh, uh, in the beginning, we know how much difficult it was to get this going. But now I'm going to tell you in one minute, perhaps, what is the CSF doing inside the brain? Why does the CSF go inside? It is to cool and clean. How does the CSF cool the, cool the brain? Using your sinuses. So how does it use your sinuses? When you breathe, the sinuses in your mucosa, I mean, the mucosa in your sinuses, they act like a wet t-shirt. Let's say you're wearing a wet t-shirt, you're wearing a sweaty t-shirt and sitting under a fan. And of course you will humidify the room, but that's not your purpose. Your purpose is to get yourself cool. So if you sit under a fan, you get cool just the same way when you breathe, that's a fan and your mucosa is the sweaty t-shirt. So it evaporates faster with the air current, cools, and there is evidence right now that this area is 2.5 to 4 degrees cooler. And where is this largest collection of CSF? It is right in the middle of the sinuses. So you can see this is the suprastellar system and all these sinuses are lined around it. And this cool CSF is pumped into the brain. And what do they use to pump? How is it pumped into the brain? The vascular pulsations. That's the Archimedes school principle. These vessels, these vessels pulsate all the way into the brain. And this cool CSF is pumped into the brain. It was a crazy theory when we started off. But now we have a lot of evidence again. Professor, can you jump to the conclusions, please? Yes, uh, well, so these are the two things I would have, uh, I have gone ahead and uh, I would have liked to go on ahead and talk to you, but 15 minutes is too less. So thank you very much from Karat and uh, Godspeed. Uh, I just want to say something, uh, you know, what I show, shows is the main concept we want to really, why we have here the next generation of neurosurgeons. It doesn't matter where you're sitting in the world, okay? To come up with ideas and concepts. I don't want you to feel like, well, I'm in this small country. You don't have to be in a major center in Germany or the United States for you to come up with a great concept that will change things. I, when he did, you know, was thinking about this thing, was in Nepal, okay? So it's not exactly, you don't think of Nepal as a major place in the world where technology or ideas come from, but it's the person, not where you are. In a, in neurosurgery is a baby specialty. So much needs to be done. I want you to believe 
that you're going to do something that will transform our field. I want you to really believe that. And that is what makes change happen. And Ipe is a great example. We're very proud of him. Okay? Uh, I heard uh, about him, what he was doing. I invited him to the United States to come and speak. It was great to have him there. So this is what I want you to believe. You know, believe that you can change this very young and baby startup. I, we're very proud of you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Salim. Thank you very much. All right, thank you very much, Dr. Cherian. Next up, we will move to our Thinking Beyond the Scalpel session. Thinking Beyond the Scalpel is all about leaving the myth that, you know, if you decide to pursue neurosurgery, you have to give up all the other things. Of course, neurosurgery is certainly a specialty that will keep you up at night, but we have invited two speakers who have other things that are keeping them up at night. So we'll start off with Dr. Federico Nicolosi. He could not make it to Crete, unfortunately, but he sent us our pre-recorded talk and we'll, uh, I'll just ask Dilara, chair of the session, to come help me play this video. Hello, everyone. Before we start, before I share with you uh, Dr. Federico Nicolosi's video, I would like to introduce him. Um, Dr. Federico Nicolosi is a neurosurgeon. Um, he sent his video from Milan, uh, Italy. Uh, he's a neurosurgeon in the Humanities Research Hospital in Milan. Um, he's also a social entrepreneur, so he's going to show us how it's like being a social entrepreneur um, uh, in the field of neurosurgeon in general. Um, he is the founder and CEO of Upsurgeon, uh, a company I believe most of you or maybe all of you are familiar with. Um, yeah, he's also the lead of the training committee of the Young, Young Neurosurgeons Forum in the WFNS. Um, without further ado, I would like to start the video with you all.
Sorry, everyone. We just need to pause the video because of some technical issues. It's going a little fast. Yeah, so we just to slow it down a bit. We're trying to speed up the conference. Yeah, we'll take care of that in a second. Sorry.
We thank uh, Dr. Federico Nicolosi for taking his time and sending in his um, video for us. Uh, he said, be the change you want to see in the world, and it's nice that he has started something and uh, changing the face of neurosurgery and the way you training in it should be. Next, uh, in our session of Thinking Beyond the Scalpel, I would like to introduce our uh, professor, Professor Philippe Schucht. Um, he came from Bern, Switzerland. He's the deputy chair of neurosurgery at the in South Hospital uh, University of Bern. And, and uh, beyond his career as a neurosurgeon, uh, he's gonna talk about how is it like uh, to be a global health advocate. Um, he's the perfect definition of that, as he has um, done many work and advances in changing how neurosurgical care in Myanmar is like. Um, so, if you're ready, Professor Schucht, the stage is yours. Perfect. Okay, well, thank you very much, Galimera. Um, my name is uh, Philippe Schacht, and I was asked to talk something in which we normally don't talk about, and I'm thrilled to do this. I, I would really like to congratulate the organizers uh, for doing this kind of conference and, and organizing them on their own. And not only having the usual topics, but kind of thinking beyond what's going to be important to them. Uh, my name is Philippe Schacht. I work uh, as a neurosurgeon at the university in Switzerland. I'm head of neurosurgical oncology, so I'm a tumor surgeon for adults, for kids, at your neurovascular surgeon. This is what I do 95% of the time. And today I was asked to talk about a few other percentages of my time. I work in Myanmar as well. I work at two universities there in Mandalay and in Yangon. Um, and I was asked to share with you why I do this uh, and how we do this uh, with the idea that maybe some of you thought about doing something like this as well. These are my disclosures. Uh, so one is important. I'm going to talk about the work of a foundation which I've created. It's a non-profit foundation. Uh, there's also, I'm, I'm involved in a different company which helps to do transnational consultation for patients in developing countries. There's no financial impact on this. Why? You're all neurosurgeons. I mean, you're all overachievers, right? I mean, most of you are alpha personalities. You've seen a lot of these teachers. I mean, Abdul Rauf, I think, is like the primary idea of an alpha personality. Very high achiever, uh, top of class all the time. This is how many of you are. Why would you want to do something on top of that? That already takes up all of, all of your time. So, of course, one thing, one reason to do this is because there is a need. There are many countries where the thing that you do in your country is needed. It's not done enough. And the second thing has to do with you. Any kind of publication you read, any blog, any book on happiness, on having a fulfilled life will have a chapter and probably one of the main chapter on meaning and purpose of your life. When we think about what meaning means, meaning means belonging to or serving something bigger than yourself. And this is one of the source of happiness and fulfillment you will have in your life. This can be anything. It can be a religious group. It can be your beliefs. It can be your family, your friends, local community. As neurosurgeons, as doctors, it can also mean creating something for others. I would like to show you what we have done 
Um, but before we do this, if you want to do something like this, um, and I don't want to make a you know, raise of hands for this, but if, if you thought you wanted to do something, what are the first steps you have to do? And I think the first thing you have to do is to think about who you are and what you want to do. First question is, what are you good at? You know, if, you, if you're not a great teacher, maybe teaching others is not such a great idea. The second thing you have to think of is what you like to do. Um, this is absolutely crucial. If you don't like, really like to do something you're not going to be really good at, and hence you're going to be poor help to the people you're trying to, to help. The third thing is, if you want to do this kind of non-profit NGO type of work, think of how you want to do it. Do you want to do it by yourself in a group? Do you want to join the Red Cross or the Médecins Sans Frontières? Or how should engagement look like over the years? And then the last thing is really think of where you want to do that. And I say this because if you do these kind of projects, and I really engage you to start early doing this kind of work, then you will go there for many years in a row. If you don't like the cold, don't go to Siberia. Go for a place you actually like being. I was at your place 10 years ago, in 2010, I just got my neurosurgeon's degree, and I thought I would like to do something on top or in parallel to my normal career. My idea was I wanted to improve neurosurgical care somewhere. And I thought I would like to do this not by doing the surgery on my own, but my focus was on building local neurosurgical capacity. In other words, helping to create a neurosurgical community in a country. When we first thought about this, and we, we approached the Red Cross, the Médecins Sans Frontières, we started screening for countries who could use a uh, project like this, and we came up with Myanmar. Myanmar 2011 was a country of 50 million people, so it's the size of you know, Italy or France. It, has, um, it just came out of 50 years of military rule, which was brutal for the country, and they had four neurosurgeons. I don't know how many neurosurgeons are in your country, but you do the math. This is more than 10 million patients or people, potential patients, for one neurosurgeon. It was the worst healthcare system, better only than Sierra Leone, which means that countries such as Palestine and, and Gola were actually much better off than that country. What did we decide to do? Uh, and these are the positive take-backs from the time that we've spent like, the last 10 years in Myanmar. If you want to do something, and what we have done, the first and most important thing is to form a group. You cannot do nonprofit on your own. It's much too bothersome. There are too many drawbacks. It's too difficult. Take your friends, like-minded colleagues, form a group. Make a long-term plan. Don't make it a one-year thing for you. Try to think long-term. Make a sustainable long-term plan. Focus on knowledge transfer. Yes. There might be money in your country. Money is never the issue. The one thing that you have, which nobody else has, is knowledge. Share your knowledge. Make this your primary goal. Then, very crucial, try to get a local buy-in. There's no, there's no sense in going to a country without the support from the local community. Patients, doctors, healthcare officials, all the way down to the politicians. If they're not on your side, any project will invent, invariably fail. And then money, uh, a lot of people have great ideas. They don't do it because they don't have the money. And that's the other way around. Don't do that. Think of how you're going to get funded. But at the beginning, have a great idea. Start having results. Then you get some traction. Then you have something to show up. And then people will fund you to scale your project later on. What have we done? This is the Swiss Neurosurgeons uh, International. We assembled a 10-year program. Um, our ambition was to train 60 neurosurgeons for this country over a 10 year period. Uh, we trained 25 of them in my hospitals. We took them from Myanmar, trained them in Switzerland, uh, and the others were trained on site in Yangon with many other colleagues. There was an American team, uh, there was an English team that helped us do this on the way. We created workshops, we went over there, we had spinal workshops, we had cranial workshops, we had cadaver workshops always together with the local community. We also went there. So year by year, we would talk to the local community and say, okay, what do you want to learn next year? At the beginning, it was like a herniated disc, then it was meningioma, then it was glioma, all the way to intracranial, uh, to, to uh, low-grade glioma in the insula. We brought them IOM. 
They nowadays are capable of doing the same neurosurgery that we have. Doing these kind of missions, not where we just go to do surgery, but we make a program together that we teach that we do combined surgery with them. If you're interested in this, there's a publication where we kind of write this stepwise plan that we did over the last 10 years for neurosurgery. Now, as kind of a, as to share with you what failed and that what I think is very dangerous for us to do uh, in these countries. The first thing is that whatever you're gonna do in these countries, think of the influence you're gonna have on these people. If you just go to a, to a country and you do surgery, let's say on a child, and then you go home, what's gonna happen to this child? There's very high likelihood it will have an infection or something, and then it's simply gonna die. So be very careful about what this patient is gonna do the moment you fly back home. Think of the influence of what you're gonna have on the local doctors. You're the, you're the expert, the world famous neurosurgeon coming in from Italy, coming in from Greece somewhere. How is the local doctor gonna look like if the complicated cases are being done by you? Think of the negative influence that's gonna have on the local community and how you can counteract that. Think on the healthcare system. In many countries nowadays, healthcare is being outsourced by the government to NGOs and nonprofits because they do this. And that makes you know, the, the, the government spending all their money on military. So think of what, you're going, what kind of an influence you're gonna have on the country. I've seen a lot of NGOs and nonprofits doing hit and runs, basically parachuting into a country, life-saving surgeries for two weeks, and then they're gone. And they have a huge negative impact on all the different states of their society. Please try to avoid that. There are countries now where you can go and they will charge you for doing surgery, right? Uh, many countries where you can go and, you know, a herniated disc is gonna be $200, not for the patient to pay, but for you to pay as a doctor so that you can do kind of good karma work. Try to avoid that at all. And secondly, and the third thing is you see when you go to third world countries, you see a lot of secondhand stuff. You know, it's kind of old craniotomy machines, old navigation units. There's a reason we don't want to keep them in our place because they failed, they're broken, they don't really work anymore. Please don't just ship them over. If you want to have them to have great equipment, make sure that this is good equipment that comes with a maintenance program, not just stuff we can't use anymore. And then lastly, uh, and, and here's a take back system where we, you've heard the story about Myanmar, it was freed. Um, 10 years ago, uh, and now in February, we had a coup. There was a military coup. The military seized power again, and the first one under attack uh, were the doctors. Um, but now the entire medical community is blacklisted. Um, most of them, some of them, I mean, friends of ours have been killed. Other ones are persecuted. Most of them have joined the resistance. And I just put this here as a reminder that as gratifying as all this work is, you have to be ready for a bumpy road, but there will be crisis on end doing this. Good, I would like to thank uh, my team, and these are the people we did this work together. Uh, these are my friends, uh, colleagues, like you have colleagues now with whom we started the, this program 10 years ago, and these are all residents who came along, and most of them then just stayed for a couple of months to help out the local community in Yangon and in Mandalay. I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. Professor. Just one, I'm sorry, just one thing. Here's my email address. I'm here. If somebody has something he wants to do that has a question, just come to me or write me an email. Uh, Professor Schultz, I loved what you presented. Amazing stuff. You know, as neurosurgeons, we're global thinkers. It's very different than other specialties, okay? So what he is doing is really, we want to contribute. We're not limited by our borders or our city. So this is exactly what you want. We want you to be in the future, okay? How do you contribute beyond, you know, where you live uh, and, and give back, okay? Uh, what he's doing here is just amazing. As many of you know, I started the Africa Initiative for Children with Hydrocephalus, part of the Game of Society. We want you to think of these kind of things where you contribute, you know. Uh, we are blamed in neurosurgery for being 
very arrogant, and that may be true, uh, you know, in many ways. But at the same time, I want you to think there are things bigger than you. Always believe there are things bigger than you. You're not the most important person in the room. That is the future generation of neurosurgeons we want. And Professor Schultz really a great example. You know, so this is just beautiful. Thank you so much. Professor Short, I would like to add something. Uh, I mean, this was a beautiful TED Talk kind of presentation, sir. Um, and there was a lot of storytelling, obviously. So just from a student perspective, I think, um, as I said in the beginning, the things that stick in our minds even a year from now are the anecdotal things, the stories that we hear on these conferences. So obviously, every country has its own culture. There might be a radical um, religious influence on people's perception of medicine as well. So have you encountered these kinds of challenges in doctor-patient communication when in Myanmar? Was there any, is there any example that you have in mind that you would like to elaborate on, Professor? Yeah, I, I would love to do that. Um, now, one thing is, we, we, we've, you know, we, we trained a lot of doctors, uh, and we did surgery on hundreds of patients. The vast majority went well. And, and I say this because I'm proud of it and also because that's the way it is. But we learn from the bad cases, right? I, I, there was this talk about the experienced surgeon being the one with a lot of mistakes, and that's true for everything. So I, I will share my worst story with you. Uh, we went to a place called Miek, which is in the Adaman Sea. It's in the very south, gorgeous place. And there we met a young woman, 22, two little children, has a brain tumor. I'm a brain surgeon, so I see a brain tumor, I want to take it out, right? And this, is what I do. this is my thinking. So there's this patient, and she's like Glasgow 12 or something. Um, very small community hospital. What do we do? Uh, we first, we find a sterile urine catheter. Uh, we put that in as an EVD. She comes up, Glasgow 14 or so, so we're very happy, good about that. And then we organize to take her to the capital, to Yangon, to do treatment on her. Um, and, and we get a plane, we get everything ready, we fly her over, she's finally in Yangon, we schedule surgery for the next day, it was kind of a, I think it was an intraventricular meningioma actually, but it was a big thing. So we're very happy, next day we're gonna have this surgery, next day we come to the hospital, patient's gone. She left the hospital. But the story behind this is the family actually took the road while we flew, and they took her again and took her to the village, and there she died a week later. Why did they do that? Because the people in Miek, in southern Myanmar, they're Buddhists, they believe in reincarnation, and they believe that they are being born again where they die. So the worst possible thing for that family was for her to die in the capital because they speak a different language, and then she won't be able to talk to anyone, right? Now, the humbling thing about this experience for us was you have to consider what kind of people you're dealing with. Are the cultural differences you might think, you know, we know the world, we know the science, this is all bogus, but that's not the reality of these people. And as Westerners, we always have to think of what cultural context are we working in? Uh, and, and this certainly was for me a very humbling experience where we think we know it better and we actually don't. So that's my story for you. Thank you, Professor. Next, I would like to just invite Stefan on the stage, our sponsorship chair, because it's, uh, we will continue with the workshops now, and he will tell us how to get there and meet with the companies. Exactly. My name is Stefan. I'm the... Thank you so much. Um, I'm the chair of the sponsoring and responsible for the financial side of the Congress and responsible for the workshops. Those are next up. And um, we've sent you a list with all of the participants, and there you can see which group, group you are in at. And um, if you haven't seen the list, we've uh, printed it out and pinned it on the door over there. I will be standing next to the door too. So if you have any questions, I can help you at the beginning. Furthermore, you, we send out a rotational plan where you can see um, which each group um, has planned. We have five workshops. At your end, next, um, um, then we have MLP. Um, the AUN workshop will be here on the main stage. The um, online workshops are next them, and MLP will be in the smaller halls over there. And the workshop of Absurgeon, you've probably already seen, is where you got your coffee. And the Evanus workshop is upstairs, so you have to go through. 
where you got the coffee and then go upstairs so you can find um, the Evernest workshop. Um, please um, look into the WhatsApp group. We have put in the plan. Um, if you have any questions or can find it, either you ask um, a different, uh, someone next to you who has the plan. If not, I will be next to the doors. The workshop will be like 20 minutes, so you need to be quick. Thank you.
one, two. UN is a conceptual issue. It's the first time in the history of medicine we created uh, a university. Okay, I'm going to turn this off for a second. Regulations department. Uh, she's the chair of that department. Eric is uh, the vice chair. Anna is from Romania. Eric is from Germany. And Grace uh, is our vice uh, is our, on our board from uh, from Bulgaria. Okay. The whole idea is this: Why do we need a university for neurosurgery? There are three groups, or layers of people that we're trying to uh, work with: medical students residents and neurosurgeons. What do we do for medical students? Well, in most medical schools in the United States, for example, you have an, uh, during your clinical years, you may spend two or three weeks in neurosurgery. That's it. 
Then you're trying to make a lifelong decision. You're going to go into neurosurgery after two or three weeks of rotating and watching somebody do it. No way. I mean, there's no way you understand it or know it, right? What we're creating here for medical students is we're going to have medical students at the level that no medical student ever has been before entering neurosurgery, probably at level or first or second year resident as far as knowledge is concerned. For the medical students, uh, you do this as part of your medical school and you get a degree, a bachelor degree in neurosurgery, which is a unique degree, but that's what we're doing, okay? For what do you have to do for that? You have to take our academic courses and the, the, the whole program is based on two things, academic knowledge and research. You have to get involved in a research project with us in the AUN uh, that these are mostly multi-center, multinational projects and your name will be in this project as a major publication. That has to happen to be able to graduate. The minimum amount of time is gonna be two years, but depending how long your medical school is, you could pace it over three, four, five years, okay. For residents, as a resident, when I trained, I had neurosurgeons, five, six, seven neurosurgeons. Under these walls, you train for six, seven years. Whatever they teach you is what you learn, right? So to keep, develop these silos of knowledge. So we decided we want to have you train in the traditional program and be part of a parallel system, which is this university. No program in the world can have the best of everything in subspecialty in neurosurgery. It just doesn't happen, okay? There's no mathematical way you get that. So you train with your people, but you're part of a university where we have the top experts in the world that are teaching at the same time but knowledge, understanding, new technologies. So it's a parallel system. So instead of just being in here, you're running two parallel systems throughout your residency. A resident will get a master's degree in neurosurgery at the end of that, okay? How about for neurosurgeons who already finished? We have a PhD in neurosurgery for them. What they have to do, they have to get all the academic, uh, we have core courses, everybody has to pass them for their level they have to lead a major research project being a principal investigator with us and take it all the way that's the thesis the phd thesis it has to be published in a major journal so each layer has to be involved in research neurosurgery is a very young specialty you have to learn how to do research we're going to teach you how to do it we're going to teach you the whole process from all the way from a idea to publication every process you're going to learn with us how do you put the idea together, uh, literature search, bias stats, uh, the whole thing, okay? So those are the principles in which this is based on. Uh, and I will give you a little bit more details as far as uh, the university program is concerned. So uh, let me first show you, uh, you got the QR code. Let me just show you a very quick video here. The narrator here is Chantel. She's standing back there. She's our president for our Medical Student Club of Ireland, okay? The volume again. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that's how it works. Program 
Okay, so I'm gonna start with a, uh, uh, we're gonna do something fun here. We only have a few minutes. I'm gonna teach you, I, I'm gonna show you a little example how we teach. We do not teach traditional way in this university. It's not PowerPoint slides and somebody's reading slides, no, no. We're gonna teach you in a very comprehensive way and we're assuming you know nothing about neurosurgery. So this is really designed for medical students, right? So we do prefer people to have done that. We have a lot of students who wanna start their first year of medical school, which is totally fine. We do prefer them having taken neuroanatomy. But beyond that, we're gonna take you all the way, okay? So I'm gonna, I'm gonna just show you a quick case and show you how I, we would be teaching uh, in this university and for you to understand. And as a fun thing, we're gonna do we're gonna have a, I'm gonna do a little quiz for you and that some questions you will answer. Now, some of you, for you where the app is working, use it, otherwise use a paper thing, put your name and put your answers on it. Uh, we are gonna have prizes for the top winners at the uh, gala dinner tomorrow night, okay? Just a fun thing, all right? So uh, if you could do that. Uh, so I'm gonna start with a case. Uh, and I'm gonna to talk to you a little, about, a little about it. And then I'm gonna ask you some questions based on what I'm telling you, okay? Every question we ask in the AUN, the answer is in the presentation. So there's no weird stuff here, okay? It's all there, all right? It's just for you to, to figure it out, okay? Uh, and that's how we do all the AUN courses and how we're gonna teach you this stuff, right? So I'm gonna go ahead and start with you here. All right, I'm gonna show you a case of an aneurysm, okay, in the brain, all right? Uh, this is all, you know, so just, I have Corey, who's the head of IT for us and stuff. We're just trying to put, this is actually beta testing for the big session I'm doing tomorrow morning here at nine. We're just trying to make sure the technology is working as well. Anyway, so as far as uh, the, uh, this is concerned, so as, in medical school, we learn about anatomy of the vessels looking from below, but that's never the anatomy you're looking at as a neurosurgeon coming from the side or whatever. So it's very different. So all I want to do in this session is to transpose your mind and looking at these vessels from a different angle. So that's what I'm trying to achieve in this five minutes, okay? So for example, so we have, uh, we have the internal carotid artery. It enters the head here and goes around like this, okay? What I want you to appreciate is as it enters intracranially, it's right next to the optic nerve, which becomes a chiasm. So these are the two optic nerves. Okay, this is optic tract, okay, going backwards, all right? So that's the relationship between the carotid artery and the optic nerve, okay? Now, Let's chart moving this into the direction where we're going to be looking at this from surgery. It will never be that, right? But that's what we see in anatomy books, right? So let's now start moving. Why am I moving this way? Because I'm going to come at this. I'm going to come at this from the sylvian fissure. I'm going to inside this fissure. I'm going to enter to come down here. So I'm gonna keep moving this in that direction to have your mind really look at it from that angle, which is the angle how we would be looking at this, right? So slowly, I'm gonna show you how this changes and what you need to know from uh, just do this. Okay. What is happening once the carotid enters the head it's now and it divides into two vessels. One is the middle cerebral artery. The other is the anterior cerebral artery, okay? We call this a bifurcation. And the surgery we're gonna do today is a patient who has an aneurysm sitting right here. This we call a carotid bifurcation aneurysm, just by definition where it is, right? So there's an the aneurysm sitting right here. How are we gonna get to that, okay? Of course, we never are looking from below. So we do need to come from above. 
we need to come We're gonna come from here. We're gonna go like this inside and come down here. Now we'll come down here. We're gonna be looking for the carotid, the middle cerebral artery, and anterior cerebral artery. We need to rely on landmarks as we're looking down there to know what's what, and we need to figure that out, right? So that's the idea, all right? So let's go ahead and do this surgery and get down there and uh, Okay, so now in a realistic way, as a surgeon, I'm standing at the head right here. I'm looking down, okay? So things are a little reversed, right? So our frontal lobe is right here, temporal lobe is right here, okay? So what do we need to do? We need to do uh, a craniotomy like this, and we call this a terrional craniotomy, okay? That opening, why we're doing that is because we have to identify the sylvian fissure that's sitting right here. It's through this sylvian fissure we're gonna go down, okay? So that's why we did the craniotomy right there. Now we're gonna go down to the carotid and the bifurcation to the inners, all right? So this is the angle, you know, just wanna get you to, 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 to see that from that perspective. All right, so okay, so let's do orange you now. We did the craniotomy on the left side, okay? We went down through the sylvian fissure. So this is our temporal lobe. This is our frontal lobe. We just opened this sylvian fissure right here to get down there, okay? So what are we seeing here? So we are seeing this conglomeration of things. Question number one, okay? That either on your thing or write it down, okay? And you, you cannot change it after we move on because I'm gonna tell you the answer. So let's, uh, you know, don't be cheating on me now, all right? So, which one is the anterior cerebral artery? A, B, or C, or it's behind this, D. Put that answer first. You know, I showed you the orientation, so I just wanna be sure how, if you're thinking about this the right way. Okay, once you're done, we will move. Okay, if you guys are done with that, I'm gonna ask question number two. Okay. So, uh, the question number two is gonna be, uh, where is the optic tract? Is it is it A, is it B, or is it C, or is behind us and we cannot see it on the left side? Optic tract of the visual pathway. Okay, submit your answers, please.
Okay, so I just did this sylvium. I went through the sylvium fissure, okay? And what am I looking at here? So of course we said the carotid artery is here, internal carotid artery, because we're upside down now. That here is the anterior cerebral artery. All the people got it right. That is the middle cerebral artery. Of course, it's going to the sylvian fissure and our aneurysm is sitting here behind us, okay? And then as far as the, uh, we said the carotid artery has a close relationship with the optic nerve, which is right here. That was a difficult question because that's the optic nerve, okay? But you cannot see in a very subtle way that the optic nerve ends right here. So that's gotta be the chiasm. So this part is the optic tract right there. That was not easy, I have to say, okay? Uh, so that's the anatomy that I want you to start thinking about as we teach you more and more about how to think about these things, all right? Uh, just the style of how we're gonna teach this to you, okay? Yeah. So anyway, so the surgery is here. In my left, tomorrow I'm gonna, during the uh, 9 a.m. session, I'm gonna show you how to hold the instruments and things like that that I'm holding, okay? So in my left hand is a suction here, and my right hand is a bipolar. Okay, so you have to learn very well to use both hands in a very coordinated fashion, right? Microsurgery is the heart of neurosurgery. If you're a really good microsurgeon, it just shows how good you are with your hands, okay? Uh, so what you're seeing me doing here is that I'm gonna be shrinking this in. See, the traditional technique is just so you know, if, you know, if you were to show this case to most neurosurgeons, you see the aneurysm, you put a clip on it, okay? Slowly, we've advanced this technique a little bit. The problem is what happens where complications occur. You see, we saw the big vessels, of course, the carotid, the anterior cerebral artery, and the middle cerebral artery. The problem is there are these tiny vessels that we call the perforators. These perforators supply critical areas of the brain, and they're too small for you. Not, you're not seeing them right now. The problem with these perforators they are behind the aneurysm coming off this fabrication and they're going to areas like the internal capsule and very important areas of the brain. So if I were to do the traditional technique, the standard thing is done all over the world today, okay? Which is go in, I saw the aneurysm, I'll put the clip across the neck of the aneurysm, going all the way down. You're not seeing the perforators behind you and the clip may obstruct some of these perforators and you cannot see it. Patient wakes up from surgery, not moving the other side. Wow, what happened? We don't know. Maybe it's a perforator. Well, my whole idea is anticipate what could happen. How can you prevent it? Based on that, I came up with this concept that instead of putting a clip on the aneurysm, let's reshape the aneurysm, make it into a baby aneurysm so we could see behind it before we put the clip. Okay. So this is how I do larger aneurysms, what I'm going to show you here. So what you see me doing here, I am just gonna change this aneurysm right there. See how I'm shrinking it down to, be, to become a baby aneurysm. Now this technique is difficult. It should only be done in the hands of very experienced because of course you could rupture the aneurysm, but once you get really good at it, it's a game change, okay? What I'm showing here, okay? Uh, it, it could change the aneurysm completely. You see, it's uh, becoming a baby, tiny little aneurysm. What does that do? You see behind me, all these perforators, all these little arteries, there's no way you could have seen those when you put the clip up front. Some of them could be obstructed. Now I could see every one of those tiny vessels. So I'm gonna put the clip in the direct vision. I know the outcome of this patient as I'm doing the surgery. It's not a guess game what happens after surgery, okay? You see, I see everything behind it now. So it's not a blind way of putting a clip on, right? So that's the idea that, the, so you see all these tiny arteries now, right? So that's uh, the techniques that we're gonna teach you, okay? See, now we see everything behind this and, uh, and now we're putting the clips to finish this. This is now putting clips 
where I directly see everything. There is no way I can injure anything at this point. There's no guessing game, all right? All right, so that was kind of uh, just a little flavor. We're gonna give you a more detailed thing about how to think about surgery tomorrow morning when we do the presentation, the anatomic presentation. I'm gonna invite Anna, who's a chair of our regulations department to speak to you. The vice chair is Eric Freund here, okay? Uh, and Anna, please. So I would like to present to you some of our most important regulations and uh, the ones that are, we are more, more, mostly asked about. We are, first of all, a non-profit organization and the first neurosurgery university in the world. We are based in the United States, but we are an online university, so it won't interfere with your home university at all, since you can take the courses in your free time. Uh, once you enroll in our in our university, your courses won't have an expiry date. So you, as as we as we thought, you will take at least two two years in order. We offer three degrees in, in the neurosurgery field, and for the pre-med medical students, we offer the neuroscience bachelor degree. Uh, since most, most of us are from Europe, I would like to mention that one U.S. credit equals two ECTSs. And in order to receive the bachelor degree, you have to accumulate a total of 120 U.S. credits. But we, we act, accept uh, up to 90 credits to be transferred from the courses you have already taken. Most probably you, you will uh, transfer the credits from your medical, from your home medical university. For the master's degree, in order to graduate, you will need a total of 60 U.S. credits, but we can accept up to 50% tr transferable credits. You will have monthly live session with top neurosurgeons, so we will, you will also get interactions during your courses because the other ones are pre-recorded. -pre and your research skills will be the most developed in our university since you will be published in a major journal before you graduate as a requirement. And the most important thing is that you will learn about a lot about leadership and its importance, and especially neurosurgery. These are the most important regulations, but you can find us on social media, Instagram, Facebook, and we also have a website where you can get our contact details and anytime anything you would like to ask us we are there to answer all of your questions thank you so proud of anna eric grace all of our officers here this while senior neurosurgeons are going to be teaching the best in the world of every specialty, subspecialty neurosurgery. This is built and developed by students and residents in neurosurgery all over the world. So it's not a top down model. It's people who wanna know how they wanna learn and then we're gonna bring the best to do it. So it's done by you guys to develop this. Uh, so it, uh, you know we're gonna give a much more extensive presentation tomorrow morning, the first session in the morning, we're gonna really show you a lot as to how we will teach and stuff. But uh, yeah, if you guys uh, uh, can give your paperwork, who's picking that up, uh, Grace? And uh, if you could give those, it's just for fun and we will get a prize tomorrow night at the gala dinner. We'll have a good time. Now our officers, all of them are here. You know, Ainat, uh, all of them are here. You want questions about the AUN, please ask them. They've all been involved for months working on this. So feel comfortable to ask them any questions that you have. Thank you very much. I think, is this lunchtime? Is that what it is now? What's that? 